And uh, I'm sure you heard it many times, I have at these seminars, that when you uh, uh, hang something on the outside of your airplane, I don't care if it's a, a gun sheath or a pair of snowshoes or a boat or anything else, uh, you're, you're, going, you're going to be a test pilot. And uh, there's really nothing wrong with being a test pilot if you know you're going to perform this test safely. And uh, we don't want this test to be 99.9% uh, satisfactory. We want it to be 100% satisfactory. A few weeks ago at the uh, Egan Center, I, I saw a mobile give a presentation on pilot decision making. And he really stressed 100%. If you're, if you're the person in the airplane, you want it to work 100%, 99.999 isn't going to be good enough. You've got to have, go for 100%. And uh, I think that if we uh, look at every aspect of what we're going to do and try to analyze what could possibly go wrong, we'll be one step ahead of it. All that said, let's look at what's required to haul external loads on an airplane, specifically on floats within the state of Alaska. Number one thing we need is FAA approval. I watch a lot of airplanes haul external loads off of Lake Hood, and uh, I see things on them that leads me to believe that they don't have the proper paperwork. First thing that is required for FAA approval is you need to hold a private pilot certificate. Okay, in this case, if you're on floats, it would have to be a float rating. You need to meet the experience requirements for a commercial pilot, or a minimum of 200 hours pilot in command flight time. You must have at least 50 hours pilot in command in the make and model of airplanes you're flying. You've got to understand the attaching methods of how you're going to attach your external load. And we'll go into a little more of this later. You have to be familiar with the operating limitations. Now, the operating limitations are part of the paperwork that FAA will give you when you go in and ask for this external load permit. It'll tell you that you can haul certain types of lumber, it's got to be latched a certain way. You can haul horns, they've got to be latched a certain way. And you need also to understand how the load may affect flight characteristics. And you can do this a lot of ways. I did it by asking, watching, looking, and also some experimentation. And as I'll show you later, I started out hauling very little, and I got myself up to haul to where I'm hauling uh, what I'm allowed to haul with my uh, operating limitations. Also, we have to provide an appropriate means for displaying your certificate. That's your pink slip. And you have to display the words restricted. A minimum of two inches high, a maximum of six inches high, at every entrance to your airplane. Now, all of these things that I just got through reading are on a handout that FAA will give you if you go in and you apply for an external load permit. They'll also give you a form 8130-6. Now this 8130-6 uh, uh, requires a lot of things to be filled out, but they're kind of simple. Until you get down to one spot here, it says aircraft specification type certification data sheet, airworthiness directives. They're going to go through your paperwork and they're going to make sure that all your AD notes on that airplane are complied with. They're going to check all your STCs. They're going to take and look through your log books and make sure you have every 100 hour that's due or an annual with the dates and the names, total time of the airframe, total time of the engine, total time of the propeller. They're going to go over your paperwork and it's going to take about four to six hours to get this permit if you want to do external loads legally. Also, what you'll need is a Form 337 that says that you're going to modify your airplane. Your airplane is now going to be modified by this external load. And uh, when I went into FAA, they already had the forms printed up on the back. And in the slide presentation, I show you what it says. Uh, after you hand in your 8130 uh, form, uh, FAA will go over it, and you will receive from them a special airworthiness certificate. You also receive the form 337, which will be filled out with your limitation requirements on the back of it. You'll also receive from them operating limitations. 
Now, these operating limitations tell you what you can do and what you can't do. They tell you that the aircraft is certified in a restricted category for the carriage of the following external loads. Now, they're going to give you external load permits for what you ask for. If you go in and you want to haul moose horns, they're going to give you one for moose horns. If you go in and you want to haul lumber, they're going to ask you what type of lumber you want to haul. The first time that I went in to get my external load permit, they would only permit me to haul two foot by eight foot sheets of plywood. And a couple years later, I went back and I got a new permit, and my permit now permits me four foot by 12 foot sheets of plywood. So by demonstrated ability, I guess not crashing, they, they increased what they would let me haul. They give you a description of the loads and methods of attachments, and they give you this. Then they give you a restricted airworthiness certificate. And then there's a whole bunch of words here. It says, this airplane shall not be operated in a restricted category for other than the special purpose for which it was certified. Operations carrying persons or property for compensation or hire are prohibited. No person may be carried in this airplane in a restricted category unless he's a flight crew member. Now, the Fish and Wildlife Service gets around that because everyone that flies on the airplane is a crew member. Okay? They're part of the mission. Okay? He is a flight crew member trainee. He performs an essential function in connection with the carriage of the external load for which the aircraft is certified. Takeoffs and landings will be made to provide the least possible exposure to people and property on the ground. Takeoff landings and route flight plans will be planned so that any inadvertent or accidental release of external loads will not prevent a present a hazard to persons or property on the surface. I've watched people take off with external loads making a west, which is the only way you can make one off of Lake Hood, west or north, and they'll make their north turn out halfway down the canal. No flight will be made over densely populated or congested airways. Except for takeoffs and landings, operations shall not be conducted near a busy airport where passenger transport operations are conducted. When external loads are being carried from controlled tired airports, the pilot will advise the tire that the aircraft is in a restricted category and that it cannot accept a takeoff clearance over a densely populated area. I've watched a lot of external loads take off out of here, and they don't advise the tire that they're in a restricted category, but they do have an external load, and it is a requirement. For operations to and from Lake Hood, all takeoffs will be either made to the north or the west. All landings will be made south, southeast, or east. The operator will ensure that the aircraft flight path will remain clear of any transport passenger operations or any populated areas. It is the responsibility of the pilot to ensure that the load is properly secured to the airplane to prevent it from shifting or coming loose. All lashings or attachments shall be made with a minimum of one half inch nylon rope or three eighths manila rope. There's a contradiction when you get any other deals there. And uh, you also have to, on the first time, on a, com on a completion of every satisfactory flight check and prior to further operations, the following entry will be made in the aircraft records. Airplane flight checked at airspeed from 60 mile an hour to 120 mile an hour, whatever it is, with an external load attached consisting of, you have to explain it in writing what it was, and secured in the following manner. Size of rope, how many lashes. Aircraft in configuration or flaps, zero flaps, one notch of flaps. Sometimes you have to have a notch of flaps to keep your tail from buffeting. And on the date, and then you have to sign it and put your pilot certificate number. And this has got to be in your, in your, uh, uh, in your airplane records. It doesn't say that it has to be in your aircraft logbook. It may be the scratch pad booklet that you carry in your airplane that you mark down every flight you make. And then it says that operations will be conducted at speeds, operations shall not be conducted at speeds exceeding that for which safe controllability has previously been demonstrated. That's pretty self-explanatory.
Operating limitations, what do they cover? They cover lumber. You have dimension lumber, two by lumber, one by lumber, one by two, one by six. You have plywood, you have roofing. A lot of metal roofing is being used out in the bush. You have canoes, you have boats other than canoes. You have antlers, then you have miscellaneous other building materials, styrofoam floats that you're gonna put underneath your dock. Uh, sauna tubes for pouring concrete foundations. The other type of external load that you might uh, want to haul is uh, airplane parts. Airplane crashes out in the woods and you want to bring the wings back to town, you want to bring the fuselage back to town. In this particular case, you have to go in and get a one-time pink slip, a restricted category for hauling that load. And if you want to, from what FAA told me the other day, that if you have two loads you want to bring out, they led me to believe that I was going to have to get a permit to haul both loads. That they're not going to give me a, a, a permit that I can take my airplane and just go out there and keep salvaging this, this wreck out in the field. So that takes a one-time permit. You have to go in and fill out the paperwork and tell them what you want to do. Now, there's different types of airplanes that uh, have supplemental flight manuals, SFMs, to haul external loads. There's no special restricted category for these airplanes. Uh, uh, the aircraft itself has, has a supplemental flight manual which, uh, which uh, shows how the attachments are made. It usually in includes attachments on the struts or on the floats. And uh, in the slide presentation, I have a, uh, a slide of the beaver attachment for hauling a canoe. The Cessna 195, there's not too many of those around now on floats, but the Cessna 195 has a supplemental flight manual that it will permit you to haul canoes. It's a certain type of canoe, and you can haul up to two of them, but when you haul them, you manifold them. And there was a cover that went underneath them. And they sat on the spreader bars. Uh, to haul anything else on a, on a Cessna 195 required a restricted category permit. The Beaver that I told you I have a slide on, uh, it's permitted to haul a 16 foot 6 inch canoe. It has to have certain type of attachments on the strut. The particular Beaver itself has to be certified with this supplemental flight manual. Every Beaver that's been made does not do that. But both Beavers and Otters can haul other external loads with a supplemental flight manual. I couldn't track any of these down. I talked to FAA. Uh, they really couldn't help me much. Told me if I couldn't answer the questions to send you in there. So I don't know what they would do with you. But uh, things to remember when hauling external loads. One thing I've seen on Lake Hood is uh, I've seen people leave here with lumber and they get it tied on with bungees. Nothing but a bungee cord. For six bucks you can go down and buy 30 bungee cords down there at Costco. You know, and uh, uh, I'd be rather reluctant to hang uh, something as heavy as lumber on the side of my airplane with, uh, with bungees. Now, putting bungees on uh, snowshoes, skis, and those things that you put on a jury struts on a cub, uh, I think that's probably an acceptable method. Myself, I'd be rather reluctant to do it, but uh, it may be okay, but not, not really on heavy loads. The FAA permits you to use uh, uh, manila rope or nylon rope. Uh, on the operating limitations, uh, they, they talk about four lashes of one quarter inch nylon rope when you're tying down. Uh, I personally uh, don't do that. Four lashes of nylon, quarter inch nylon rope to me is, 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 uh, is leaving me a lot of room for having loose ropes. What I do is I use 3 8 inch, inch nylon rope that's braided like a clothesline. I talked to uh, Johnny uh, Wallace over at FAA last week about that, and he claims that their engineering department is going to start to look into what people are using to tie external loads on and maybe change the writing in there. That hasn't been looked at for a long time. But uh, manila rope is good because you can tie it tight. It doesn't stretch when it gets wet, but the problem I have with it, it cuts easy. And usually when you're tying a load on your, on, on your side of your airplane, lumber above your float, you're going around the bottom of your, 
you're going around the bottom of your uh, struts and we take our floats on and off our airplane every year and these struts get banged up and down so we got these jagged edges down there on there so you have a tendency to the, or can have a tendency for the ropes to cut so uh, I personally like the uh, like the half inch uh, or the three eighths inch nylon rope. Tie down straps. The beaver permits you to use a tie down strap to hold the uh, hold the canoe on. But one of the requirements of this of using this tie down strap is every year you have to subject this tie down strap and its buckle to a thousand pound test. And it's written in there what process you have to go through to certify that this strap and, and, and the buckle is going to work and uh, I have a real problem with using the small narrow blue tie down straps they look real neat you can ratchet everything up real tight but you've got a piece of metal there that uh, uh, made in Korea I don't know where they're made but you're, you're relying on that piece of metal holding all that wood on and uh, it's not good enough for me. Now, I would use those tie-down straps, and I have where I've got a bundle of wood on the side, two layers of two-by-fours down the side of one of the floats. I will secure the leading edge together with that strap where there's no possibility of it working. Another thing to remember is no matter, uh, no matter how good your buddy or helper is, never let anybody tie your load on your airplane. No one. They can help you load it. Tie every knot yourself. If you don't know how to tie knots, learn how to tie knots from a, from a Boy Scout book or something else before you uh, tie all these knots. Some knots will slip. On dimension lumber, should e you should either tie the leading edge together or you can nail them down. I, I've seen it done with these battery powered screwdrivers. You can go in and you can screw the wood together and you get there you can unscrew the wood with a battery powered screwdriver. Um, I've, uh, I've hauled tube of six uh, and larger, tube of eights and tube of twelves up to 18 feet long and uh, I've never nailed the ends together. I've just banded them together with a rope and tied them off tight and I've never had any problem with the two by material opening up. Uh, on the uh, on one by material, I take an extra precaution to to make sure that they don't open because they'll have they're lighter and have a lot more tendency to flex. A friend of mine, he's here in the audience, a heckler. He got a banding machine, and when he hauls the things out, he puts a metal band around. He bands the bundle up when he puts it on the airplane, so there's no chance of anything coming apart. On plywood and roofing, I usually haul that on the spreader bars. And I use seat clamp on the front and the back to secure the bundles together so they won't fish mouth. And when I tie, I tie back and forth across the front uh, spreader bar, back and forth across the back spreader bar. And then I will bring a rope from that back rope and pull it up to the front seat clamp and from the front rope to the back seat clamp. And that way there's no, no way possible that this load can shift front or back. And also by doing that, you can tighten up the gut wrap that you have over the spreader bars. When I haul roofing, uh, if it's possible, I like to put a piece of plywood down first to keep the roofing from not scratching up my struts or my crossbars. And since roofing has an up and down feature to it, I put pieces of wood in those openings and I clamp it together. I try to restrict as much air as I can from going through that and giving me a uh, an area to, to catch wind. And then I just use the same principle. I C clamp it. And of course, strap it back and forth. Doors, they're best hauled on the spreader bars if they fit, even if you have to put plywood on both sides. And uh, I would say uh, when you're working around your spreader bars, and even when you're working with dimensional lumber like that, on the, on the side, you have to take particular care with not getting your control cables, your water rudder cables, your, your crossover cables, uh, your retract cable uh, caught up in, uh, in any of your lashings. There's times when you have to block the back up. What I do, if I've got 18-foot lumber, it has a tendency to sag in the back, especially if it's a one-by type of material, 
I will take blocks and I'll wire the blocks to my back uh, tie down fitting on my float to hold the lumber up so that it doesn't touch any of the fittings. Getting back to doors, last year I hauled, uh, I hauled two metal doors and they were just blanks, no frames. And I put them on the side of the airplane because I didn't have any plywood. And, it was, and I hauled them 50 some miles north of here. This is a, other than a canoe I hauled, it was the absolute worst load I've ever hauled. You could sit there and the airplane would run nice and stable and you'd hit a little burble in the air and the airplane it just it would go sideways about 15, 20 degrees. And you'd bring it back and all the way I just had to sit there and drive this airplane. It, uh, it was an extremely unstable load and I had the doors on the left side. I made a promise to myself if I ever hauled any more doors I was going to put them on the spreader bars and just haul extra plywood. Another thing we have to watch out for, you hear a lot of people say, well, I hauled this much on my airplane, I hauled that much on my airplane. I don't see the guy in the crowd here that, uh, but uh, I see the guy that owns the airplane now. But he says, I can get off Lake Hood with 21 sheets of half-inch plywood. He said, it won't haul 23. I tried 23, and it won't get on a step. Now the airplane will haul the load. Uh, there's no, no, no problem with the 185. You've got 1,050 pounds down there. You've got 100, 170 pounds of himself. You've got a few gallons of fuel in there. You're, you may be cheating gross a little bit, but the airplane will fly. But if you look at the way floats are put on an airplane, and you can look at this one over here. You've got all these doubler plates all over the side of this airplane, great big square slabs down the side, and a float fitting connected to it. And you've got this 1,800-pound airplane sitting on them. Now what we're doing is we're putting, you've got 400 and some pounds of floats, and you've got 1,000 pounds of lumber. Now what you're doing is you're pulling on those bolt heads. This is all that's holding it. They're made to hold the load down on it, and now you're pulling on them. I talked to Jay Fry about this yesterday at lunch, and he said that when given the opportunity, he's going to uh, have his engineering crew look and see what it would take to pull those bolts out. Now, they're not going to get pulled out, I don't think, in just flying in, in regular weather. But you take off and you make a 50-mile trip or a 100-mile trip, and usually the longer the trip, the heavier you're going to load the airplane. Most of the flying I've done is about a 10-mile trip. I've done some out of Lake Good here, but I do most of it on a 10-mile trip in this, this lake I'm at. And uh, I pretty much know what the weather is going to be in 10 miles. But if you're going 100 miles, you can go up there and get into some little white puffy clouds, and all of a sudden you, you start hammering the airplane. The airplane gets buffeted. So every time it does that, you're pulling on those fittings. How long does it take to pull those fittings out? I don't know. You, you build three cabins, you sell the airplane, the next guy builds three cabins, and the next guy goes out there and doesn't pump his floats, and the floats get pulled off. So it's something you need to... It isn't how much the airplane will haul, it's how much safely you want to hang down on the bottom of that airplane without tearing those floats off at some time. Another thing is overloading, you know, with a cub. Uh, the cubs that have the clamp on fittings, you just got a bunch of real small clamps there, or real small bolts with nuts on them and you're if you overload the floats on a cub you're pulling on that I don't know how long it'll last but it's something we need to we need to think of these these things are are, are not made to be put in tension like that I, I spent about the last six to eight weeks researching what to say on this thing because I'm, I'm no expert on it. I've just I've done a little of it and I just uh, unfortunately happened to know someone that set up the agenda on this thing. But uh, <laughs> I've, I've heard some real, real war, war stories. I, I'd like to tell you a couple of them. I don't, I don't know all the particulars, but uh, one yesterday, Jay Fry told me, guy gets where he's gone, lands in a canoe in there. Now, I hauled a canoe, and it's a terrible load. I've hauled two of them. I swear I'll never haul another one of them flexible green ones. And uh, if I lost a canoe, I think I'd know it. But anyway, this guy lost a canoe. He gets there, and he doesn't have a canoe. 
I've heard of dimensional lumber sliding off the side of airplanes and just slipping out the back. They get back there and part of the lumber's missing. I mean, it's hard to believe that this could happen, but, but uh, it happens. In, in 1955 or thereabouts, which is about five years before I came to this country, uh, there was a doctor building a cabin on Rolly Joe. Some of you may know, even know this particular case. I, I believe he was flying a, a sedan. He's building his cabin on Red Shirt Lake. Well, his wife wants a bathroom. So he takes off out of Lake Hood here, and back in those days, I don't think you needed a restricted uh, uh, certificate to fly. You just, you know, if you could tie it on, you flew it. And uh, people flew everything from, from stoves to refrigerators to, to, uh, to ranges and everything on the outside. If you could tie it on, I mean, they, they flew it. I mean, that's how they got things out there. You, I'll show you a couple pictures where the, the airplanes were small. You couldn't, you couldn't stick a refrigerator in a, in a, in a, in a PA-12. So where'd you put it? You know, put it on the side. Well, anyway, this doctor took off out of Lake Hood with this, uh, uh, with this bathtub on there, and they, 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 they found him and his airplane parts across the inlet here. He never made it across the inlet. Now, back in those days, they didn't, they didn't inspect a wreck as good as they do now. I mean, they check your paperwork, see if your paperwork caused the accident now. But you don't. <laughs> but, you, but you don't, you, you know, you don't know if, uh, if you pulled a fitting loose from the airplane, if a rope broke loose and all of them didn't break loose, if he had a heart attack or what. But I mean, uh, he got off of Lake Hood made it clear across the inlet, and they crashed. So, uh, you know, just because the airplane will take off with a certain load doesn't mean you're going to make it all the way. And I, uh, I'd like to have you, have you think about that. I was told another story by uh, Tom Ballou, who's a safety officer for Fish and Wildlife. I quizzed him a couple weeks ago on what he knew about external loads. And, Typically in Tom's way, he says, well, I don't know much. And then we sat there for two hours and talked. And uh, actually, he talked. But he told me uh, uh, about a Fish and Wildlife Service beaver. They put two canoes on it. And they were gone to, I don't know, Middleton Island or somewhere. And a guy took it out here and dropped her down off the ramp, sucked the gear up, went around. Everything flew good. They brought it back over, and they loaded everybody on it put the rest of the gear on, the people on it, went over here to International Airport, and in those days all you had was six right, or actually two four right. He took off, and never got out of ground effect, and was happy to land over there and unload everything on Fire Island. So, uh, uh, <laughs> I got another, uh, another story that, uh, that uh, uh, Tom told me about a guy at Kodiak, uh, flew for Alaska Airlines in the late 40s, early 50s. I got his name here, but I won't give it to you. But he was flying a Norseman. He put a boat on backwards. He put the flat end on the back, okay, figuring that make it go through the air quicker. Well, anyway, Tom said that he was taken off, took off of, uh, too high? Okay. Well, anyway, he's flying this Norseman. He's got this boat. He's got the front backwards, and He's gone from someplace in Kodiak to Carluck Lake. He climbed for an hour, never got over 600 feet. The airplane just wouldn't climb. Tom said, he told me that he, he knew he had to make one landing, and he said, why should I make it anywhere else? He said, if I'm going to wreck this thing, I might as well take the boat where I'm gone. So he made it all the way over to Carluck, uh, Carluck Lake uh, before he even tried to land the airplane. But uh, the airplane would fly, but it just wouldn't climb. Uh, i now like to, to show you a few slides that I've assembled from many people. Some of them show loads that uh, were done before you needed restricted permits. There's a couple of slides in there that show things that, uh, that uh, I blocked the numbers off the tail. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, after that, uh, hopefully I can, uh, I'll try to answer any questions I can. If you have any, Jay Fry has offered to help me, and also uh, Tom Wardley, if there's any questions, and, and also Ted. Ted's 
Ted's quite an external load hauler. And uh, let's see if we can get this slide projector going here. You want to control it from up front? I got a button, yeah. I got a button up. I got a button. I got, I got one up there already, yeah. That's a buzz job I had one time when I was fishing. <laughs> that's actually a that's actually a painting. I guess they had quite a bit of trouble when that picture first came out. Everybody thought that they were jeopardizing that airplane to take that picture. A picture by a well-known aviation artist, and I took it off the cover of a parts magazine. Wrong way. Excuse me. I put this in here just to show you. This is a. In, in 1983, I switched airplanes from an 80, uh, from a 180 to a 185, and I went back in to get an external load permit. And uh, Betty Rogers was the person that gave me this external load permit, and she also gave me mine in '85, which I went back in. I discarded this thing and went back in for bigger and better things. But she said, you know, due to possible adverse flight characteristics, I am unable to authorize four-foot plywood for an external load. The Alaska or aircraft maintenance record form needs to be placed in the aircraft log. Well, I tried and tried and tried, and Betty told me there's no way if I take this airplane up, I'm going to stall it in a turn, I'm going to stall it on landing. And uh, I didn't argue with her. I'm not going to stall an airplane. I mean, I'm, when you have an external load, hopefully you're not out looking at moose. I mean, I make the neatest turns and the longest approaches when I got an external load. And I think all of you probably do that too. But I put this in here to show you that, that after a couple years of demonstrated ability, I was able to, uh, to increase uh, load uh, restrictions that they had on me. Now this is the back of the th Form 337, Operating Limitation Restricted Category External Load. Now this is off of the 85 permit, the other one was the 83. And the loads will be special. That's all it says. The front's got a few names on it. That's basically all it says. There's no modifications at all to the airplane which is different than if you have a cub and you're putting a, uh, a lumber rack or something underneath of it, but I'm just strictly talking about floats here. This here particular uh, uh, piece of paper is, goes in your aircraft maintenance record. And when they issue you a pink slip, you have to put that in your book, okay? And this is my latest one that I'm on, my pink slip that I'm operating under right now. It tells me that I'm, uh, I'm in a special airworthiness certificate, restricted external load operations in Alaska. It's only good in Alaska. If I sell that airplane, I lose it. The person doesn't pick up that external load permit when he buys the airplane. If you, if you move the airplane out of the state of Alaska, it also becomes null and void. And this is just to show you that you don't have to go through that paperwork every year. I get this permit in 85, in 86, I went in and I got extended for one year. 88, I got it extended for one year. And then I didn't have any money in 89. So I didn't build anything. So I didn't, I didn't get 89. So I went back in in 1990, and I got them to extend that same permit. And that permit lets me haul up to 18-foot lumber, two 18-foot canoes. I can haul four by 12-foot sheets of plywood. And they got them restrictions on there of how to tie it. And like I said, my, my attaching methods, I think, are better than what they have. And uh, I've never had a load slip. This is, uh, some of you are familiar with Cash Witten Lakes up on the Parks Highway. Uh, this is my truck driver, it's my wife. Uh, last summer I hauled up, a, uh, oh, I guess I hauled about 18 loads. It took me three days to do it. I'm tying plywood underneath there. I have seven sheets of plywood. I've got myself restricted to seven sheets of plywood. It weighs about 53 pounds of sheet, 5.8 CDX, or not CDX, but texture 111. And that's about 350 pounds. My permit permits me 400 pounds of weight and four foot frontal area. And this is a closer up look at that same picture that shows the seat clamps. 
in the front and the back, and how I pull that front rope back to that back seat clamp. And how I pull the back rope up to the front seat clamp so the, the, the load can't go frontwards or backwards. And I've never had, never had one of these moves. You run into a little problem if you go to 12 foot plywood because you're sticking clear back here, basically 12 foot roofing in that. You're coming clear back over here and you have to be aware of that when you land and when you take off. That stuff's going to drag. So you have to figure out the, you know, the optimum place to put it. This is my uh, earlier airplane that I had. That, that's got a load of 12 foot roofing on it. I just kind of found it in a file and blew it up. Restricted sign got to be displayed by every entrance. It doesn't do anything for the flight, but it's a requirement. So I, I have them folded up inside my airplane. I keep them up inside the wing root, and I lay one in each corner there, tying on a load of tuba sixes. I got a load on both sides there. I'm less than 400 pounds. I weighed the boards one at a time before, or not, not every one of them, but I, I weighed three or four of them, averaged them. And uh, this is taxiing out for takeoff off that lake. This picture was taken back in the 50s. This is one of Fish and Wildlife Services airplanes. Bob Ritchie, he's now a retired pilot. He was hauling some building material off of the Kenai Airport. This is a picture of that beaver that I told you about, the external load uh, uh, supplemental flight manual. The interesting part that I found, and probably is the reason why I had trouble hauling a canoe, is it said the bow canoe must not be further aft than the line center line through the propeller and 18 inches forward of the propeller. Now, I've always had them back, and I got all that tail back there, and that's a terrible load. If I ever haul another canoe, I hope I don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up, and I'm going to tie the front of my canoe down to my front, to my front cleat, and I'm going to see how it flies. I'm just going to... It can't fly worse than it did last time. <laughs> but they got special straps, special fittings. And that's the only way you can haul a canoe on this airplane that I can tell. There's a couple other pages that go with this thing without having a restricted airworthiness certificate or uh, some kind of a special piece of paper from FAA. And like I said, I'm not sure if you can haul external loads on a beaver and an otter and haul people or not. I see it done out here with the, by the commercial boys, so there, there must be some piece of paper in there, but uh, uh, part one. Now, Reverend Ernest Donaldson said nothing as he walked out of the... We're strictly talking 91 here. There's a... Bunt end forward. Definitely isn't in front of the propeller. But that's a government airplane. Now here's another one. I don't know if you'd want to stick that in front of the, uh, stick that uh, any farther forward, although there's plenty of clearance on these airplanes because they sit so high above the floats. Here's a boat a friend of mine hauled. He hauled that out of Anchorage about 70 miles away. Flew good, he said. There's a canoe that I hauled. Now, I got her tied on real good, but I, I think that if I ever haul one of them again, I would try to pull this down. I'd like to let the back ride up, and I'd like to pull it forward. I think I got a different picture in there, a little, little bit better picture of it. But, but I got so much of that hanging out the back. Now, that's a 17-foot canoe, and I'm entitled to haul an 18-foot canoe, according to my paperwork. And, uh, but I think it has a lot to do with the, with the flexing. If I was going to haul a canoe, a lot of times, I would go down here to one of these upholstery shops, and I think I would have a, a top made for that that I could tie on real tight to keep the air from going in, and I think it would really make a nice load. This is Tom Wardley, back there at uh, uh, Lake Washington down there. Uh, the beaver base down there, and it jumps my, jumps the end of my tongue where this is, Tom. Tom, where is this? Kenmore, Kenmore Air Harbor. That's when, when Tom, Tom worked Kenmore Air Harbor. Now this is, what is this, a 65 horse? Yes. 65 horse champ. Got a canoe hanging on the side of it. 
That's back before you needed paperwork. This is the one I was telling you about. I kind of blocked most of the number off. This is a, this is a, let me, let me read this. The guy was real good to tell me all about it. He, he no longer owns the airplane. This picture was taken 20 some years ago. That's a 19 foot Alumacraft boat with a six foot wide at the gunnels. He's got it six inches after the propeller. He put 21 gallons in his, in his port wing tank. He kept his starboard wing tank empty. This next picture here, he's got it four inches forward of the water rudder. But he took off a late could with this. It's hanging nine inches in the water. Okay, now, you know, you're laughing. You think it's an unsafe load, but I think that if I was flying that airplane, it'd definitely be unsafe. I think the guy, the guy's got 20 some, maybe 30,000 hours, and uh, he's got the the boat is tied very heavily from the seats. There's very few ropes across the outside, but every one of those seats is tied in there. He's got them tied to the back cleat, to the front cleat. But here's what he said. He said he applied power in a tight right turn coming upon a step. At five o'clock in the morning, no waiver required. <laughs> <laughs> but surprisingly, this, those of you that know beavers, you gotta have, you gotta have some flaps on a beaver if you want the thing to climb, but at five degrees of flaps on that airplane, an 85 mile an hour, it was a hands-off flight. There was no buffeting or anything. And to look at that, you'd think that, the, that there was gonna be a lot more work to it than that. Now that's, uh, like I say, that's, uh, it's because of an experienced pilot. Like I say, I would, I would, be, uh, I would be afraid to, afraid to try to do that myself. I got this picture out of Private Pilot magazine. Some of you probably get this. And uh, this is Whip Air. Whip Air is trying to get this uh, one eight, or 206 on 4,000 floats certified to haul a 14-foot smoker craft or luma craft, luma craft boat. They got to shoot tail cone on this thing so that they go up there, they get in trouble, they can float the airplane down. They had to go up and do full stalls to get certified. They couldn't get the airplane, or not stalls, excuse me, spins. They couldn't get the airplane. They couldn't get the airplane to stay in the spin according to the, uh, I, I talked to the engineer back there at the factory and their quality assurance, and I got this uh, picture, uh, or permission to use this picture in compliments of Don Downey, who, uh, who's a writer for, uh, for Private Pilot Magazine along with others. But he said they couldn't keep it in a spin more than a half a turn because the turbulence off the boat would wash the tail out in the airplane and just flatten out. I guess they, they did have some trouble when they first started this test. They just, uh, I was told that right after takeoff, the, the, the parachute deployed and they, they, they ruined one airplane. Uh, this is how they t tied it on the front. Now, Obviously, they're, they're designing this float to haul this boat, so they got this cleat strategically located so they can tie on. We don't have that on all our airplanes or on all our floats. And they got all this special webbing. They don't have the thing certified. Uh, I talked to uh, uh, Jay Fry the other day, like I mentioned, and he, he said that they thought about certifying some of their floats to haul airplanes, and it says it's just, or haul boats, and it just about isn't worth it. But I think the reason they're doing this is sooner or later, and it's coming, coming to a head out in America, you're not going to be able to get a restricted category permit to haul an external load. So you're going to have to have a supplemental flight manual airplane if you're going to haul something. So and I think that's where they're gone. I haven't been told that. Uh, I tried to get you some more pictures of this thing, but uh, the uh, guy that owns the company was out of town, and, and uh, they didn't want to release any pictures without his approval. Ah. Tom Wardley again, huh? Now this is a 75T craft. And he's got four floats. <laughs> and he told me that those are uh, uh, set of 13, 20, 13, 20s. And the airplane flew good. And uh, that picture was taken about 46, I think, 47 down there at, uh, on Lake Washington again. This is just a little 
Everybody's seen this picture. But this picture was given to me by the guy that gave me the boat with the, the big boat on the side of the airplane. He said, if you put the junk opposite the torque, canoe on a port side, let the air out of the raft, I added, if the paperwork is complete, you can report ready for a west. He said, hell, that beaver will fly. You know, and, and it may. But it's... Uh, That's all I have on the slide presentation. I don't know if I can answer any questions or if you have any, but I'd be more than happy to try to field some. What type of knot do you use on your lumber? What's that? I just I use a square knot, I guess, when I come on the front. And then I always take my rope from the front tie down and I bring it to the back. And I'm going to tie a lumber on the side. I pull the front to the back and the back to the front. And I don't leave any dangling ends of ropes. And uh, I think that's the secret is, is pulling the tight. And I, get, I buy a new rope every year. I never have any trouble losing it. I mean, I just leave it around my float shack and it disappears. But I do. When I'm, when I'm hauling, I, I buy new rope. It's, it's, it's awful cheap. I've never tried that. Like I said, the Cessna 195 is approved for a canoe on a spreader bar, and it's approved for a spreader bar on the right side. And it's approved for two of them, but they manifold them. I've never tried it. I, uh, I've never seen it done, and I'm not about to see if it works. You know, like I say, I think if you put a cover, if you put a cover on a canoe and got a real taunt cover, I, I think that uh, the adverse conditions that I saw would be gone. I hauled a 12-foot smoker craft years ago, and uh, once I was brave enough to take all the flaps off of the airplane, it, it flew good. But it buffeted with one notch of flaps on. And uh, I, I took the flaps off and it changed the airflow, and, 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 and the tail cleaned right up. But uh, it flew good, too, and I had it on the right side. No, that was a that was a double double ended canoe. It might have looked that way, but that's only approved for a double ended canoe. I think it's a Grumman canoe, and I think it's 16 foot six inches, and no other canoe. I mean, there's not too many 16 foot six inch Grumman canoes around anymore. But that's the only paperwork that I could find, and it was in the files here at the, at the Office of Aircraft Services. Well, I don't really have anything else. I just would uh, like to uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, and I would tell you that if you're going to haul an external load, uh, you ought to get the paperwork to do it. And you ought to think about what you're doing. I mean, we all want to build a cabin out in the woods. I mean, why, why else would we want an airplane and want to live in Alaska? And uh, I would just uh, like to stress that you think about what you're doing every time you do it. And if it's bad, tell somebody. Uh, a person that parks two doors up from me over here on Lake Hood, and it's been about four or five years ago, he tied one of these green canoes on his airplane. And uh, I'd already flown with one on, and he put it on a 180. And I didn't know ropes over it. And I said, Ray, uh, where are you taking a canoe? He said, well, I'm going to Sucker Lake. And I said, well, I said, I've hauled those canoes, and I like, I, I tell you, it's kind of a, it's kind of a bad load, and I think, it's, you know, you should put a little more rope on it. So anyway, I went over there, and then violated a deal where you tie somebody else's, tie somebody else's knots, but I helped him. He had the whole canoe tied to the little aluminum rack that's inside the canoe. He wouldn't have made it across the inlet with it. But I helped him tie the canoe on and, and uh, told him what I knew about it, and, uh, about a week or two later, I saw him. He said, I gotta thank you for that. He said, he said, I probably would have killed myself with that canoe. He says, because I know it would have come off. He said it was the worst load he ever flew. And he said that if he sells his cabin or if he has to take that canoe out, he's gonna give it away. He isn't gonna he isn't gonna haul it again. And uh, and uh, like I say, I don't know if other canoes are that way. Fish and Wildlife Service hauls two 18-foot canoes on a super cub all the time up in the Galena area. 
And uh, the pilots that I know that do that, they say that it, it's a clean load. And that's probably the way I tied it on. Okay, I don't have anything else. <laughs>